This is John with WesleyGospel.com. Um, if if you've been following my blog for any any time, you know that truth is one of my biggest things. Um, sound doctrine, b biblical truth, um, even apologetics at times is kind of one of my passions. But one of the things uh, I think the Lord's been correcting me about is is the uh, you know the labeling of denomination names and uh, the labeling of uh, high profile Christian teachers and you know when I associate it with something that could be false doctrine and um, and then uh, you know I inadvertently become the accuser of the brethren according to according to Revelation 12:10. And I don't want to do that. I, I want to treat, you know, the Word of God fairly, but at the same time, I want to treat the body of Christ fairly. And that's there's a tension there because the body of Christ has the Holy Spirit, but they also have flesh and they also have they're subject to error, you know. So um, there's a tension there. You know, how do you preach the truth? You know, when when you're preaching the truth. You, you got the truth on the right hand side, and you got falsehood on the left hand side. True and false, you know. It's kind of like, kind of like math in a way, you know. There's, there's true, and then there's false, right? And you've got to, you've got to divide falsehood from the truth. Otherwise, you water down the word of God so much just for the sake of unity, and now you have no truth. That's not the answer. But one of the things the Lord's shown me is that. Unity in the body of Christ. First off, we have to identify who the body of Christ is before we can proceed with an attitude of spiritual unity towards them. Who is the body of Christ? Well, it's not the cults. The cults are, 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 are groups that consistently teach against evangelical doctrine. The Jehovah Witnesses... Christian Science, Mormons, also called Latter-day Saints, Spiritualists, Zen Buddhism, Baha'i Faith, Unity School, uh, Unification Church, Scientology, Eastern Religions, Islam, and I would say Seventh-day Adventists as well. I don't know how the Seventh-day Adventists worked their way into the National Association of Evangelicals, but they are. And I don't agree with that because they teach that when people go to hell, they uh, they burn up and they cease to exist, that there is no eternal punishment. And they also teach that you should keep a Saturday Sabbath as, as, as necessary for salvation, which goes against the Bible in several areas. So um, I don't know how the Seventh-day Adventists worked, weaseled their way into the National Association of Evangelicals, but for the longest time, they've been considered a cult, and I would still consider them a cult today. But, you know, if you're looking at the NIV Study Bible, which is one of my favorite Bibles, it's kind of this non-denominational, interdenominational study Bible that was put together by the National Association of Evangelicals, different scholars from that and um, you know seeing that I'm charismatic and Pentecostal uh, I have to side with the National Association of Evangelicals because if I didn't I would be considered a cult member as Pentecostals were for a long time were considered a cult before Assemblies of God joined the NAE so um, who is who are the denominations represented by this um, by this organization um, let, me, let me just go through the thing. Aspire Network, Assemblies of God, Brethren Church, Brethren in Christ, Christian Missionary Alliance, Christian Reformed Church, Church of God Anderson, Church of God Cleveland, Church of the Nazarene, uh, Conservative Congregational, Converge Worldwide, uh, ECO, uh, Evangelical Presbyterians, Elam Fellowship, Evangelical Church, Evangelical Congregational, EV Free, Evangelical Friends, Evangelical Presbyterian, Every Nation, Fellowship of Evangelical Churches. If you're noticing the word evangelical, 
uh, Foursquare Church, Free Methodist Church, Grace Communion, uh, International Pentecostal Church of Christ, International Pentecostal Holiness Church, Missionary Church, North American Baptist, uh, Open Bible Churches, Pentecostal Free Will Baptist, Primitive Methodist, Royal House Chapel, Salvation Army, um, United Brethren, Vineyard, Wesleyan Church, and Mennonite Brethren. As you will notice, the United Pentecostal Church is not included either. They are the oneness Pentecostals who reject the Trinity, and that is a cult as well. I would consider that to be a cult as well. So, when we're talking about the accuser of the brethren, Revelation 12.10, in other words, an evil spirit that can manifest through Christians even, to accuse members of the body of Christ as being involved in false doctrine or this, that, and the other. Um, that's something we want to stay away from. You know, Baptists, Evangelicals, Pentecostals, and Charismatics are generally considered to be members of the body of Christ. And um, if we can, if we believe that, you know, the commentaries of the NIV Study Bible, if we believe that the NIE is generally accurate in what they're saying, and bringing Calvinists and Arminians and Evangelicals and Charismatics together, then yes, these are. This is what we should understand as as the body of Christ. And if you're going to be guided by the Holy Spirit in church leadership or or anything, it seems that you should not allow Calvinism and Arminianism. You should not allow um, charismatic and evangelical differences to really. Um, Turn into and turn into uh, things of division in a church. Now, you might say, well, what about the charismatic thing? I mean, how are you going to operate in the gifts of the spirit if you if you make that into an issue of division? Well, you don't have to, you know, but you don't have to like necessarily onslaught people for not receiving that, you know. Um, but I understand on the one hand, like if you if you get too distinctive with this thing, it becomes divisive. I understand on the other hand, if you if you water down theology so much just for the sake of unity, what do you have left to teach? Anecdotes, you know, um, sermons that are just platitudes. Uh, Hallmark card messages, you know, that's how we end up with secret sensitive. It's where 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 it's like theology is thrown out the window because we need unity, we need social unity in the church, we need social unity in marriages, and and so we don't want to get too much doctrine because now we're just dividing people. Is that really what the Word of God says we're supposed to do? Doesn't the Bible teach the word, doesn't the word doctrine exist so many times in the Bible? Yes. So what are we allowed to teach? I mean, this this is not a minor issue by any means. In the version um, of the Bible, it says the word doctrine exists six times. 1 Timothy 1.3 Command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. First Timothy 1.10 Whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. First Timothy 4.16 Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Second Timothy 4.3 the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to stay with their itching ears want to hear. First Titus 1.9, we must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Titus 2.1, you must, however, teach must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. So the Bible tells us to, to teach theology and to refute false doctrine. It tells us to do that. It does not tell us to ignore doctrine for the sake of unity in the church. And anybody uh, um, who does this is doing God's will, and anybody who ignores doctrine is doing God's will. 
because yeah no and that if you and that if you obey Titus 1 9 now that you're the accuser of the brethren no, hold on Titus 1 9 says we must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it what's the sound doctrine well, some, somehow it's got to be soteriology and theology that can be agreed upon by both evangelicals and Pentecostals. Uh, so that's, I would have to say that's, that's the task of the body of Christ. If we are not um, doing that, we are not doing the will of God. We might think we are, but we're not. We might just be nice people with the universalistic tendencies to tolerate people from all sorts of religious backgrounds, but we're not necessarily preaching sound doctrine or refuting those who oppose it. And therein lies the problem. That can create pull the wool over our eyes. It can create spiritual blindness. And then when some ill-intentioned person comes into the church with a definite agenda to harm and to divide, we're not going to be equipped to face them because we haven't been teaching sound doctrine or refuting those who oppose it. But if we iron sharp and iron ourselves on a regular basis, with sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. If we're used to that, then when some false prophet or some false teacher comes into the church, we're going to be able to see. We're going to be able to tell. We're not going to be dull. Our, 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 our swords will be sharp and wedded and, uh, and ready for combat. Love, unity, yes. Sound doctrine and refuting those who who um, oppose it. Yes, that is not the accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren is where we we tack we tackle when the Pentecostals attack Baptists and Baptists attack Pentecostals. That's accuser of the brethren, and I'm guilty of that. Well, I've tried to figure out what sound doctrine is. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm guilty of that. What does the Bible truly say about false teachers and false prophets? Um, I found this this article on Bible.org. It's called Recognizing False Teachers, and I thought it was pretty good. Um, we've got Matthew 7, 15 to 20, which says, Watch out for false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are voracious wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Grapes are not gathered from thorns or figs from thistles, are they? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree is not able to bear bad fruit, nor a bad tree to bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will recognize them by their fruit. In other words, fruit is your behavior, like the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, righteousness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If those character traits are in the person, nine times out of ten, if that person's a prophet or a Bible teacher, they're true. They're from the Lord. But if the character traits are the opposite of that, hatred, discord, unrest, impatience, um, lack of self-control, bad temper, that's a false prophet. Um, because those are the opposite of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Um, now, we all give it to the flesh time and time again, but if this is like the general way that person acts, that person is not being animated by the Holy Spirit. They're being animated by the devil. Um, Uh, 
to recognize false teachers, we must know they will come. Matthew 7, 15, watch out for false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. They come to you looking like just any other church member, but inwardly they're voracious wolves. In other words, they're they're mean. They're mean people. Um, if the person's a mean person and they come off like they're a prophet and they're just a mean person, it's a false teacher. Um, now you might say, well, well, Jesus wasn't very nice to the Pharisees in Matthew 23 where he rebuked all the scribes and Pharisees as hypocrites. That's true, but in that case, what you have there is a nice person rebuking the mean people for their meanness. It's not that rebuking is never in order. It's that who's rebuking who and why. You know, if you're if you're a nice person that generally is nice and preaches righteousness, and then you see a mean person who generally is mean, and you are rebuking, you have a moment where you rebuke that mean person. You're doing the will of God for doing that. Um, so it's not that. You're not allowed to ever rebuke a person ever. It's who's doing the rebuking and why is there rebuking going on. Um, so what's the general habitual attitude of the person it, I think is, is key in really determining what a true prophet and a false prophet are. Um, and it's usually character traits you're looking at. It's not giftedness. It's not um, ability to teach or even ability to prophesy accurately. It's more about their character traits. Um, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I'm looking for other stuff that's different. He keeps repeating this Matthew in this article. He keeps on repeating the Matthew 7 uh, thing over and over and over again, which I can see why it, it's, it's central uh, to that. Um, trying to look for some other, some other scriptures. Okay, here we go. Great. Second Peter two one. But false prophets arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. These false teachers will infiltrate your midst with destructive heresies, even to the point of denying the master who bought them. As a result, they will bring swift destruction on themselves. So this is why it's so important to have sound doctrine. You know, because how if you never spend time teaching sound doctrine, you're not going to be able to recognize when somebody comes in with a false doctrine. All right. So that's what a heresy is. It's Second Peter two one tells us why it's important to care about theology. It's not it's not that you throw theology out the window so that you can maintain unity in the church. It's that I mean, there's always a, a tactful way to go about all of this. But here, here you have a, an example of a person who denies Jesus. Uh, I don't know what kind of a heresy that would be. Maybe, maybe um, denying that he was the son of God or something, like a liberal or something, comes in and says that Jesus was just a good man, but he wasn't the son of God. You know, there's a lot of people out there like that. Um, uh, let's see. Here's a great one. First John 4, 1 to 3. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to, to determine if they come from God, because many false prophets have gone out, gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus as the Christ, who has come in the flesh, is from God. But every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard is coming and is now already in the world. There's a lot of people who have false views of Jesus. There's a lot of people who think that Jesus was just a man, you know. But here he, they're saying one of the attributes of a false prophet is a person who says that Jesus is just a man. He was not God in human form. And this is what they're saying. If you believe in the deity of Christ, that's a sign you're a true believer. You have to believe in the deity of Christ, that Jesus is God in human form. Um, and that it's antichrist to believe that he's just a man, which large numbers of people who call themselves Christians believe that. 
Um, and so that's that's a definite sign of a, a person who might be a false teacher. Um, uh, somebody who rejects the deity of Jesus, who rejects that Jesus is the Son of God. There's a lot of people out there that are like that. Um, 2 Peter 1, 2 says many will follow their debauched lifestyles because of these false teachers the way of truth will be slandered so they have immoral lifestyles like they're involved in sexual immorality and don't even think anything's wrong with it um so that's a sign of a false teacher um uh, lack of marital faithfulness Um, so that's that's uh, really all I have to say for now. Um, you kind of get the feeling that a false teacher is really a person who's just evil. Yeah, they're evil. They they they're mean. They're hateful. They're evil. They're immoral. They take advantage of people, um, and they do not believe Jesus is the Son of God. They have weird views about Jesus, but they do not believe he's the Son of God. And uh, we have to, you know, unity is so important. I, I agree, but we've got to understand, you know, there are cults out there, and then there are evangelicals. If we can't identify the difference between evangelicals and cult people, we're confused, and we need to draw a line. I remember when I got saved, I was saved in a non-denominational charismatic church. They were part of the Rock Church, which is an evangelical church. And I'm glad for that because I, I, my experiences there were true. I, I felt the Holy Spirit, and I, I truly believe it was the Holy Spirit. But I remember that their attitude towards the Mormons was very conciliatory. Like they did not really take a hardline stance of them being a cult. And that's that's a problem. You know, Mormons might be nice people, they might be nice American citizens and responsible members of society, but the the Mormons they they, they have a, a a scripture called the Book of Mormon. It has all sorts of things in it that are um that are anti biblical. Um one of which is to say that um, there are multiple gods. Um, and, and another is, which is to say is that people uh, should be involved in polygamy today, uh, which both of those things are contradicted by the New Testament alone, let alone the Old Testament. So, uh, um, you know, I, I would just recommend, you know, going through Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin, which is, you know, it's kind of a non-denominational standard book on being able to identify cult beliefs. Um, but not only that, I mean, it's we've got to also have sound doctrine. It's it's not only the negative declarations we need to make, we also need to make positive declarations on doctrine as well, you know. But at the same time, doctrine can't be so watered down that it's nothing definite so that some, when some false teacher comes in, he's able to just mess everything up. Because everybody's, nobody's like been grounded in sound doctrine, you know. But so what is sound doctrine, you know? I would have to say that sound doctrine is, sound doctrine that is sound enough to be able to ground people in the faith of the Bible without causing disunity if some guy comes in with an agenda. Um, so I, I would have to say that, you know, generally speaking, probably the most mainstream uh, theology book that I'm aware of is Wayne Grudem's book, Systematic Theology, where there's room for Pentecostals and Charismatics in that, and then there's also room for Calvinists and Arminians. It's like, take your pick. <laughs> it's very broad. And there's a reason why Wayne Grudem's book, Systematic Theology, has, has you know stood the test of time since 1995. I mean, for for a church leader, you know, point of view, uh, stuff like that 
is is probably really useful to be able to you know provide some sort of a groundwork that's solid enough to be able to teach sound doctrine and help people that way. God bless you out there. This is John with WesleyGospel.com.